On this special edition of Independent Sources, Bedford-Stuyvesant, the gentrification frontier, why the central Brooklyn neighborhood is losing its black residents in droves. That story and more coming up on Independent Sources. Welcome to Independent Sources, bringing you news from New York's ethnic and immigrant communities. I'm Zyphus Lebrun. According to the last census, the white population in Bedford-Stuyvesant is skyrocketing. The central Brooklyn neighborhood reported the largest percentage increase of whites in the city from 2000 to 2010. That's a far cry from the area that was once known for violent crimes and racial tensions, immortalized in the Spike Lee film, Do the Right Thing. Here with me in studio to discuss the impetus for this change and how it's affecting longtime black residents are Richard Flateau, bed native and owner of Flateau Realty Corps. Mr. Flateau is chair of the Economic Development Committee of Community Board 3 that covers Bedford-Stuyvesant. Judge Betty Staten, a former family court judge who is now president of Brooklyn-based Legal Services NYC, they oversee the representation of bed renters alleging illegal expulsion from their apartments, and Colvin W. Granham, who served as president of Bedford-Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation since March 2001. Judge and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me. Good to be here. Thank you. Okay, great. So let's just start with the obvious question, uh, and, I'll, and I'll start with you, Richard. Um, why are we seeing um, this movement of, uh, of this, these new neighbors into Bedford-Stuyvesant? What, what do you think is behind that? I think it's largely the housing stock, um, the fact that the crime rate has come down so dramatically, and also the fact that Bedford-Stuyvesant has a tremendous transportation infrastructure. Mm. And we're getting a lot of capital from throughout the world coming into Bedford-Stuyvesant as a result. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, with a lot of these, with all the new neighbors coming in, a lot of the folks are being pushed out, particularly black um, neighbors. Where uh, are these folks ending up? Where do we see these, these folks going? Well, unfortunately, a lot of them are ending up homeless. Uh, there was originally a push to go out to East New York in that area, but now we're seeing, I mean, Brooklyn has become the place to be. And the gentrification is affecting Bed-Stuy overwhelmingly, but is creeping slowly out into the other areas. So therefore, and even in East New York, as the housing stock goes up, as mm -hmm. the prices go up, the folks that are being pushed out cannot afford housing anywhere in this city. That's the whole problem now. We're becoming a city where poor people are not welcome and cannot live. I want us to take a look at this uh, a, a young woman who's actually trying to make the most out of this situation in Bed-Stuy. Since Kai Avant de Leon opened her high-end curated concept store in Bed-Stuy, uh, many say she's revolutionizing retail and the changing neighborhood. Abby Ishola spoke to the Bed-Stuy native about what inspired her to open the store and her mixed emotions on the gentrification that's happening around her. I'm Kai Avent De Leon, um, and I'm the owner of Sincerely Tommy. The store itself is a concept store, meaning that all of the clothing, uh, artwork, jewelry, accessories that we carry are all from emerging brands from around the world. Um, and we, we really tried to adhere to that concept to kind of create this platform for new artists to showcase their work. We are located in Bed-Stuy, which happens to be the neighborhood where I grew up. Um, and I always knew I wanted to have it here because I just wanted to contribute to the changes going on in the neighborhood and I've just always really enjoyed the vibe of community and the intimacy that comes with living in this neighborhood. Tommy stands for Tompkins. I'm on the corner of Monroe and Tompkins and I also grew up on Jefferson and Tompkins. And I love having the option of being able to stay local. Uh, being able to eat in Bed-Stuy is awesome. But I also feel as though there should be more of a direct connection to the people who are, are originally in this area. I don't see that 
that often. It's, it's usually a case where people kind of come in and there's this sense of entitlement or um, there's just, I'm going to set up shop, but I'm not making sure that I'm connecting to the people who have been here. If it wasn't for my grandmother, this business wouldn't exist. Uh, she's played probably the most key role in this process besides my mom. She came here in the 80s uh, from Grenada and worked day and night to uh, buy her first brownstone for $60,000 in bed -Stuy. And everyone told her not to because that's when bed -Stuy was still <laughs> bed -Stuy. Um, and then since then, she's kind of just been diving into the real estate world, if you will, and investing in properties in the neighborhood. Getting more locals in here is really important to us because we get a lot of people from Bushwick and Williamsburg and even from the city. Uh, but I think a lot of people in the neighborhood don't really know about us yet. Um, so, yeah, that's our, our next step. So, uh, Richard, we just saw Kai's story. Do you think her story is more aberration than norm in, in, in bed -Stuy right now? Well, uh, I know she has a lot of support because uh, I personally know the grandmother, Doreen De Leon, and um, the mother. So that part is kind of unusual, having that kind of family support and starting a business. Um, but there has been a proliferation of, of new businesses along that particular street, Tompkins Avenue, as well as a lot of the other commercial streets in Bedford Stuyvesant. Mm -hmm. And now, are these more black owned? Or are these owned by people who have lived there for a long time? Are we seeing that? Well, um, honestly, uh, most of the businesses that I've seen, and I actually review businesses that are looking for liquor licenses, so most of those businesses have been from relative newcomers, in part because there's a substantial amount of capital involved. And um, in the case of Kai, I think she had um, her grandmother who actually owns that building. So she has some support in terms of getting the business started. And capital is still a major barrier for a lot of the um, minority entrepreneurs in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Calvin, is there, you know, just to pick, piggyback on something Richard just said, are you, is there an effort maybe to, to assist people who may not have the kind of backing that Kai has from her grandmother and so forth? Is there an effort in, in bed -Stuy to to maybe promote black ownership uh, in, in, of businesses that are popping up? Definitely. And uh, we actually have something called the Brooklyn Business Center at Restoration. It's a group that does um, entrepreneurial training and, um, and loan readiness. So they help people put together their uh, strategic plans and loan packages for, uh, to apply to banks for financing. So, yes, um, but you still, but I, I don't know that it's going to compensate for the avalanche of capital that's coming from outside the community. And, uh, you know, people just see it as a wonderful opportunity because the real estate is relatively cheap. It, it is a beautiful, beautiful neighborhood, as you well know. And, and there's a lot more affluence gravitating. There's not, you know, it's, I was interested in Richard's response to the question about whether it was an aberration because my first response would have been it's not because there are lots of new entrepreneurs. But he's right that it is to some extent because she's got a lot of backing from her, you know, family. And most of these entrepreneurs do, right? They, they friends and family loans, et cetera, that permits them to be young mm -hmm. and adventuresome and entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. So, um, Judge Dayton, I have one more uh, question for you. Is the movement that we're seeing amongst blacks in the neighborhood, are we seeing that amongst black owners, or are we just seeing this amongst black renters? Well, <laughs> we have forced movement out of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the whole foreclosure era took away a lot of the property for people who had owned property for years and years. So that just gave the impetus for the uh, investors and the others to come in and grab this property before we knew what was happening, before the real push, before we got money to fight that. And now we have 
you know, it's great to have people come in. It's great to have the neighborhood change. Unfortunately, those were not available for us until more recently when it began to gentrify. So we have people coming in now who are doing all kinds of illegal acts to displace, rent control, rent stabilize, all these kinds of tenants, and move them and just displace them out of the neighborhood. And much of it is illegal. Much of it is through the loopholes in the rent stabilization law. Much of it is just plain illegal mm -hmm. with hoodlands going in and, and frightening people and having them to leave. Actually, I mean, really, I mean, if you read in the paper, even the housing inspectors were part of that whole thing where they went through an apartment and says, the police is coming, you have to leave. And it was just a ploy. And fortunately, there was a woman who had some information, and I hope she got it from us in our educational, that this is not the way you get lose your apartment. You have to be legally evicted, but a lot of them are not legally. They're illegally, they, they, they offer them money. And if someone who's poor is offered $5,000 to move, they don't realize that that five, you know, or even I'll pay your rent for a year. They don't realize at the end of the year they're in an apartment that's now going to cost them $2,000. They've spent that $5,000 and all they have is public assistance. So it's all those kinds of tricks right. of displacing people and making them leave the neighborhood that I'm against because as the young woman pointed out, so many of the newcomers come with a sense of entitlement. Best Star is a special neighborhood. It was culturally relevant. It was close-knit. And you come in and you have a whole kind of different vibe going on. It's, you know, we're fighting to hold on to our culture. We're fighting to hold on to that feeling of community that's always been a part of Best Star, even when crime was high, right, right, right. even then. That's a fascinating, uh, fascinating point. Uh, um, we'll just hold a second, gentlemen. One, we'll we'll come back in a second. Stay tuned. We'll be back with more in our conversation about gentrification in Bedford Stuyvesant. Uh, before that, Crystal Lowe has some other news. Thanks, Cyphus. Here's a look at some headlines from New York's ethnic and community media. New York immigration advocacy groups, workers, students, unions, and community organizations recently came together to protest a preliminary injunction issued by U.S. District Court Judge Andrew S. Hannon, temporarily blocking President Obama's executive action on immigration. Angelica Salgado, a 40-year-old Mexican mother who volunteers at La Fuente Community Organization, calls the motion an act of intimidation. Labor unions 32BJ, 1199, and Local 79 joined the New York Immigration Coalition and nonprofits La Fuente and Make the Road to New York is encouraging prospective DACA and DAPA recipients to not be fearful of the judge's decision and to continue to make preparations to apply for immigration benefits. Gay City News reports that LGBT activists are calling for a boycott on this year's St. Patrick's Day Parade. Organizers of the parade have allowed an LGBT employee group called Out at NBC Universal to march in the parade this year. But activists are calling this no more than a publicity stunt meant to placate sponsors and make it appear as though the 24-year-old ban on Irish LGBT groups has ended. Activists are asking that all elected officials boycott the parade. The parade will be held on March 17th on Fifth Avenue between 44th and 79th Streets. The Queen's Courier reports that a historic landmark in Flushing, Queens is facing demolition. The African Methodist Episcopal Church dates back to the 1800s and remains one of the borough's two surviving stops on the Underground Railroad. Church officials concerned with structural problems are considering building a new church on the site. Reverend Richard McEckern confirmed that they are in the first stages of tearing down the church so a new worship site could be built. Members of the congregation are furious that a vital link to an important part of African-American history will be lost. And finally, from the Haitian Times, Frandy John, a 26-year-old Haitian artist, has debuted his latest collection titled Art as Narrative. His paintings are featured at the Art Gallery and the Theater for the New City. John says this collection is dedicated to the stories of women, specifically market ladies and children. He says these women are an essential part of Haiti's economy, and they go unnoticed. John also says that his mission is to get people to be open-minded about Haitian culture. His work will be on display at the Theater for the New City from now through April 10, 2015. Those were just a few headlines from the city's ethnic and community media. Independent sources will be right back. 
Thanks for staying tuned to our Independent Sources Special, Gentrification in Bedford-Stuyvesant. With me in studio today are Colvin Granham, Richard Flatill, and Judge Betty Staten. Thank you again for being with us. So just before we went to break, uh, Judge Staten was making a point, and I know Richard and you, Colvin, you wanted to pick up. So Richard, we'll start with you. Yes, um, I'm familiar with a situation that Judge Staten mentioned, um, and uh, there were some building inspectors, I think, that were part of 50 that ended up getting uh, arrested for corruption and uh, they, some of them helped the uh, landlord in terms of evicting people. So I think there is a certain amount of harassment taking place with um, tenants, but I, there's another trend happening and that's where people that are just older um, may decide for lifestyle reasons that um, they want to go somewhere that has a lower cost of living. And um, in those cases, uh, especially as you get to the Stuyvesant Heights section of Bedford-Stuyvesant, um, the marginal buyer has not been African-American. So um, there are very few African-Americans that have been buying in, in those situations where long-time residents are leaving for, you know, reasons of their own. And uh, that's having a dramatic effect on the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a very clear template for this because it's been done in Fort Greene. It's been done in Clinton Hill you know, and it's moving east. And uh, when I grew up in Clinton Hill, the majority of homeowners, all of the homeowners were black. Right. And people of, you know, African descent. And I, I would assume it's lower than 15% today. And the same kinds of businesses, the boutique businesses are all across. But, I, you know, my feeling is that we're gonna look like Clinton Hill unless there's some policy intervention which means, and this is somewhat controversial, but I firmly believe it, that we're going to have to reinvent how Bedford-Stuyvesant looks architecturally. We're going to have to think about new kinds of housing along Fulton Street and other uh, major commercial corridors. And we're going to really have to fight, I mean, uh, for uh, moderate and middle-income people to have a place in their housing, because you could do high-density housing, but it could be all luxury. Mm -hmm. But to the extent, and there's a little bit of a tension in the community between whether we want it aesthetically to look like it looked in 1940 or, you know, 1920 for the people who it was built for, who actually were building suburban homes, or whether we want to make it a 21st, 22nd century uh, community that addresses the needs of the people who are there now. Mm -hmm. But it was built to be a moderate, to be an affluent community. Mm -hmm. And by virtue of the departure of those folks, we came into control of it, very tenuous control. Right, because in the, and, it, 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 right, we're seeing, and, and that's one of the things I wanted to kind of ask, because in the 50s, there was a, a, a definite change. There was the, the, the shift that happened mm -hmm. was that the majority of, of whites moved out of the neighborhood in the 50s. And what I kind of am sensing now is that is what we're seeing a reversal of what happened in the 50s right now? Is that, is that what's yes. happening? Yes, it is. I mean, apparently the, uh, the children and grandchildren and those who moved uh, recognized the mistake that was made and given up. It's very valuable property. It's a beautiful area. Um, there was one, say, walkthrough on TV. They have this program walkthrough, and my sister saw it, and she said, oh, my God, there goes the neighborhood. And they see how beautiful these homes is. Everybody's going to come to Bed-Stuy. And uh, they recognized, well, you know, some of the prices in, in Manhattan pushed them here. But then they brought their friends. They brought everybody. Everybody started to come, so I'm talking about Bed-Stuy as in Clinton Hill. I live in Clinton Hill still. And... Um, all of a sudden, I look around, because I lived in, in, in Best Eye for many, many years, and I never, ever saw a white person on the street. Never. And in, in my elementary school, there was like two, uh, and that was way back, and I won't tell you how long. <laughs> um, but all of a sudden, I'm saying, what, 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 what? you know? It became so quick. It, it just came so quick. Uh, Quickly, it just started, and you saw then, and then you saw more, and you saw more, and you and, and the neighborhood, you're like, what are we going to do? I have friends who live in Stuyvesant Heights, and I mean, they really are, like, up in arms. Right, and, and that's one of the things, too. I mean, is is there, like, tension that's coming, that's kind of emerging because of this movement? In of, some areas, in this particular friend, very much so, because 
I mean, her, her expression is, I stand in my house that I've been in for 40 years, and they walk by me as if to say, why are you still here? Right. You know, that kind of thing. Right. So she is really up in arms. The, the two houses in Stuyvesant and Height was bought by someone from another country. Australia. You know, not mm -hmm. only from another country. country. Yeah. They saw it on the internet or something. Right. I, I, this was something that came up, that there is investment from Australia. Deep, Absolutely. Deep, yeah. And there is a lot of investment coming from overseas. I know um, Dixon Advisors, Correct. which is based in Australia, and they have money from Australian pensioners. They've been buying a lot of property in Bedford-Stuyvesant. And there have been some cultural clashes. I know just basic things like a block party. Um, which is kind of like an institution in Bedford-Stuyvesant. A lot of the newer arri uh, arrivals do not like block parties. So there is a certain amount of tension, I would say, on well, a cultural level. But Michael Jackson loves, um, BK loves Michael Jackson. This is the thing, one of the things that Spike was right, speaking was about, about yes. was called, characterizes Spike's rant, right? So he held it in the Fort Green Park for many years, and uh, the new residents, didn't like the party, so he had to move it when he had it at Restoration Plaza, mm. and we hope that he'll have it there annually, right. but that kind of tension definitely exists right. where, uh, and he talked about drumming in Mount Mars Park, right? Yes. Yeah. So yes. it's like, you know, yeah. the drumming was comforting to us, but to some other people, it's, 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 no, yeah. it's a little it's unnerving. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but, you, but you mentioned the actual <laughs> physical changing of the space that is Bedford-Stuyvesant. Yes. I wanted to come back to you on that. Yes. Now, I know that right now it's a lot of um, family homes, brownstones, and stuff like that. What would, what's, what's kind of on the table now as regards to this physical changing of the There's neighborhood? One of the things that's being proposed by the mayor, and it's one of the things that we are uh, proponents of, is along the transit corridors like Fulton Street and Myrtle and Bedford and other major corridors to build higher density mixed income housing. Um, it could be both rental and home ownership, and we're very concerned about home ownership. I mentioned that earlier because there's very little home ownership product available for a moderate income person nowadays. So, but it's reshaping portions of the community to accommodate greater density. And there's some tension around that because that's historically not what the community's been. And a lot of people say, you know, I, I don't want to see that. Right. And then some people are distrustful because historically high density housing in minority communities has been low income only right. and plagued with a range of distresses that affect right. other parts of the community. Right. So you, what, what, you're, what you're gently <laughs> saying is that you, folks don't want the buildings to turn into projects, essentially. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. All right. Um, when we come back in just a moment, some final thoughts from our guest on the topic of gentrification in Bedford-Stuyvesant. Welcome back to our special Bedford-Stuyvesant Gentrification Frontier. Um, finally, we'll do some final thoughts from our guest uh, with me, Judge Betty Staten. Um, Judge, so, you know, we've talked about a lot. We've tried to condense a lot of what's going on into a very short period of time. And I just want to get a sense from you as the, you've been a resident. You've seen a lot. You've seen these people being moved from their homes. You know, what's, what's your sense of what's going on here? Well, what's going on is a lot of illegality. Um, there are some things that are being proposed as a resolution. The mayor, for instance, has this affordable housing uh, thing for 200,000 um, more housing. But at the same time, we have to be mindful of maintaining, retaining the housing that we have because as tenants are pushed out, if you build more houses, you don't really have an increase in housing. You have people who are being pushed out, you build more houses and people are being pushed out. And one of the recommendations is uh, they have this new task force that he had a press, press release at uh, one of our offices last week uh, between the state and the city where they're, you know, really coming together to address this issue. And so they felt that with the task force that is a central task force for the state and the city, they'll be more uh, successful in really 
cracking down on the landlords. They do penalties. They pay some money, but as some people say, they know that's the price of doing business. They pay the fine and they keep doing whatever they were doing. So there has to be more of a push. It has, if they know they're going to be arrested for harassing tenants. They know they're going to be uh, held criminally liable for things. They're more likely not to do it. The next person more likely not to do it. And then they have to address because the rent stabilization law will sunset, that means will terminate in June, June 15th, if it's not reenacted. That will be a terrible, terrible blow for our community because it's protected. At least we can go into a, a house and say this is a six family or eight family. It has to be at least six family. It's stabilized. If they say it's not stabilized, then we have a way to look to see that they illegally destabilize or deregulate it. So that's very important right now. So mm -hmm. those are two kinds of things, the criminal penalties and renewing the rent stabilization law that will go far to protect and keep the, the tenants that are in the low-income stabilized housing in place as we build and add on to what we already have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, Judge Deaton just mentioned the fact, you know, keeping the tenants and so forth. What about keeping black owners? I mean, we were just talking a second ago off, off camera about the fact that you're not seeing a lot of right. black ownership. I mean, yeah, and I just actually came from a conference, a national conference in Tampa, um, hosted by the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. It's actually a national issue of um, major changes happening in the inner cities, whether it's um, Oakland, California, or Detroit, or Baltimore. And people are seeing a lot of value of being in urban areas. And uh, we definitely have a lot of pressure and harass harassment taking place here in New York. I think um, the laws uh, for rent stabilization have to be enforced. Um, in terms of what I've seen in the local market in Bedford-Stuyvesant um, in the last two years, maybe 5 to 10 percent of the buyers have been African-American. So over a period of time, we are going to see very dramatic changes. And um, I agree with Mr. Granham that, you know, there'll have to be some policy changes and, you know, allowance for higher density um, ownership opportunities in order to... Uh, help with this situation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Final thoughts from you, Colvin? I guess I have two final thoughts. One, one is that Bed-Stuy is probably a little bit more vulnerable than some other communities to this kind of displacement uh, because we have less regulated units than the average community. And I'm not arguing that they should be regulated. I'm just saying the fact is that they're not regulated. Mm -hmm. And so a family who's living there and maybe sending their kids to college, they say, you know, I can get more rent, and that could help with this college tuition, that's right. and that's what they do. And so when the lease is up, they just don't renew the lease, and there's nothing illegal about that. Right. But to Rich's point about the breadth of the phenomenon, there was a study recently released that said that Kings County was the least affordable county yeah. in the nation. And the way I understand it is, when you look at the housing prices, and you look at what people are earning, wage mm -hmm. earners, and you match the two, people are rent burden or their housing burden. So they're paying 50, 60 percent of yes. what they earn for housing. Brooklyn's been creating a lot of jobs, but those jobs have been low income jobs. Yes. And so when you match what the wage levels are and what, where the economy has been going in terms of the kinds of jobs that have been created with the housing that's coming online, <laughs> there's a big mismatch. Okay. And it's going to really take a lot of policy intervention to change that. All right. Well, yes. Colin Granham, Richard Flatill, Judge Beta Staten, wonderful conversation. I wish we had another half hour to talk, but thank you very, very much thank for being you. with us. Uh, that's our show this week. Thanks for joining us. Till the next time, be independent-minded. <laughs>